history is never black and white. Each side has their own issues they want to push. White Americans, right after the massacre, told the public that up to 2,000 people had been murdered and scalped by Indians at Fort William Henry. General Montcalm and a vast French army, determined to wipe the British out of the North Country, poured down from Lake Champlain with the goal of taking the British stronghold Fort Edward. But what they didn't expect was the heroism of the tiny garrison they would have to face first at Fort William Henry. Since having first become aware of the approaching French army, British Colonel George Monroe, commander of the two-year-old Fort William Henry, had been sending out urgent requests for reinforcements to Major General David Webb at Fort Edward, only a few miles away. But Webb, fearing the loss of his own fort, sent only a small fraction of his troops, not nearly enough. Soldiers who were at Fort Edward wrote about hearing the cannon fire in the distance. They wanted to go to support their fellow soldiers whom they knew were being killed. And their commanding officer in Fort Edward wouldn't let them go. After a long, bloody siege, the French delivered to Monroe an intercepted message from Fort Edward. No reinforcements would be coming. On August 9th, Monroe finally admitted defeat and agreed to surrender Fort William Henry. The surrender terms were generous. The British troops would keep their property and be marched safely to Fort Edward, where they agreed to withdraw from the war for 18 months. But in coming to this agreement, the European commanders did not include the viewpoint of the French native allies. There were large numbers of natives who had come from the area around the Great Lakes. They came from outside of this pattern of decades of warfare and raiding and taking prisoners. They had no understanding of what this capitulation meant, and they were also perhaps more likely to kill and, and to scalp. The terms left the natives with no plunder, a rage built in these warriors who felt that they had been betrayed and robbed of their rightful property. These warriors had individual free will and they were going to get what they wanted, what they were promised, regardless of what other people were telling them. A person fought on their own volition. They came and went when they chose to. They fought hard when they decided to and when they promised to. And when they were promised goods for doing that, they were going to get it. When the British began the march to Fort Edward, tensions were extremely high. They were terrorized and abused by the Indians. Attacks moved up the line. Military order disintegrated, and half-naked troops fled for their lives. French officers like Montcalm tried to intercede for the safety of the prisoners, but French Canadian officers did not. British survivors reported Canadians standing by as their native allies brutalized the unarmed prisoners. The French Canadians, their relations with the Indians was much more uh, intimate in the sense that they, many of these officers were probably known some of these Indians since they were, since they were young men. And so they knew very well uh, the Indians' point of view, and the Indians' point of view was, we didn't get our fair share. We want our prisoners. Fort William Henry and its dead were burned. The massacre lies 250 years in the past. What happened there has become shrouded in legend, myth, and misinformation. We believe what we want to, but history keeps changing. In 1757, 2,000 people were murdered. Now, in the 21st century, maybe 200 were killed. And you can only wonder what future generations are going to say about that event. Certainly, it has had a rather long-lasting influence on American culture and popular culture because of its central role in James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, in which that is a central event. So that event very much colors the popular American impression of this as the French and Indian War. It's just seen as a bloody, gory uh, event. These were the Indian ways. And we sort of gloss over them. We don't really mention this too much, but I mean, let's face it, this was part of their civilization too, which was absolutely unthinkable, sacrilegious in a European 
the mind. White people were developing a sense of themselves for the first time as white people. It becomes a kind of way in which uh, the very diverse European populations uh, with many different religious and cultural traditions come to see themselves as a single people. In the aftermath of the battle, colonial newspapers sent out a clarion call of outrage over the slaughter of innocents, the treachery of the French, the cowardice of Webb, and the savage barbarity of the natives. It was truly a great recruiting tool to get the whole colonies outraged and eager to fight. And you can't blame them for exaggerating because perhaps they didn't know exactly how many were killed. So this was naturally a wonderful, wonderful publicity stunt for the, uh, the British, which could then turn around and say, see how cruel they were and how, uh, how the French engineered all this and so on and so on. The end of the Battle of Fort William Henry is probably the darkest PR day ever for Native people all across North America because that was the exact kind of uh, event that Europeans could latch onto and explode and write about and spread word about the terrible savages who descended on the surrendered uh, soldiers and pillaged them, murdered them uh, in a most horrific way. And I'm not denying that something happened, but I think that there were promises made that weren't upheld. The legacy of this incident, racial hatred, intolerance, and xenophobia still resonate deep in the American psyche. I think the Seven Years' War is extraordinarily important in a lot of ways, but among its most important legacies is this ugly legacy of racial attitudes in which um, white people learn that they're white people and there's a category of people called red people. And increasingly on both sides, and this is not universal, but many Native Americans and many European Americans begin to imagine a future in which the continent really no longer can be shared by those people and it's going to be all one thing or all the other.